aside from doing media, how's your day going so far? Oh, it's going good, man. It's a, uh, I got some friends in town from home and uh, took the kids snow skiing. They'd never seen snow in their life, man. And, and then went into the Reds Hall of Fame and got, they got a chance to look at where I'm going to be inducted to in July and see some of my cool old memorabilia sitting up in the museum. So I'm having a good day. What sort of memorabilia is it that you donated to the Reds Hall of Fame? Um, I gave them uh, all of my stuff from the 06 All-Star game. So you don't realize that an All-Star game, you get some weird stuff. Like you'll get a helmet, even though you're in the, you know, you're a pitcher. You get, uh, you get a ring. Didn't know you got an All-Star game ring, you know. And I gave them my jersey, my top, you know, my, they gave us a bat, which I didn't use either. But I kind of gave them everything. The spikes I was wearing from that day, the glove. I gave them a little bit of everything. I also gave them my gold glove um that I got in 2010 a Rawlings gold glove and um I believe my game my game glove for uh probably 16 years I used that same glove from probably 2003 through 2017 something like that and um they they've got all that in the museum too so but all the music gear stays with you that's not going there no the <laughs> well anything that's retired I'd give away and all my baseball stuff is pretty much it's old hat now and uh you know, my amps, my guitars, my foot pedals, all, all the things that you've acquired over the time in music. Yeah, it's, I'm just getting started. So it's it's a definitely not giving that stuff away. Just getting started. And the new record sounds fantastic. The backing band that you've got is different than the backing band from the last album. It's incredible that you had Lee Sklar and Mike Inez and Kenny Aronoff backing you on the last one, the Stephen King cameo. This one, I used to know your bassist Ed a little bit. Pretty incredible line. Did Jamie assemble this? Is this a whole crew of former Boston people that moved to LA? Yeah, for the most part, you know, this is a crew that, so that covering the bases album with Kenny Aronoff, Lee Sklar, and uh, Michael Landau, those guys, those were hired guns by the producer who wanted to do that record. And, and you know, still friendly with those guys, but, you know, I didn't know them going into the studio and they they just knew they could crush it. And this yeah. is a totally different thing. This is This is a true band. This is a bunch of guys who met in New England in 2004 while they were playing with different bands from American Hi-Fi to Miley Cyrus to, to uh, Fuel, you know, to, to, to Narles Barkley, all these guys, they were playing in those bands. And we all got together as friends and started playing the Hot Stove Cool Music in New England for Theo, mm -hmm. Steen and Peter Gammons every year. So that's where we meet Ed, Ed Velasquez, the bass player. He puts that together and he's obviously a pretty well-known local musician around Boston. And so... Um, that's how this whole we were basically just been friends, you know, creeping on 20 years now. And we always kind of said we were going to make an original record. I don't think anybody thought that I would actually, you know, do it or actually put the time into it. But after I retired, I started getting the itch to try to write original songs and I wanted to see what would happen. And so I went out to L.A., grabbed a bunch of uh, riffs from their old, you know, 2007 iPhones that they had been, you know, a little something they had put in their in their phone in a hotel room somewhere on tour. And uh, I would bring them back to Cincinnati and try to finish these songs with Elliot Sloan from, from Bless the Union of Souls. Wow. I didn't realize that Elliot was involved in all that. I didn't see the full credits on that. Because doesn't Elliot have the weird distinction of working with Ozzy, like he played keyboards for Ozzy for a little bit? Or is that the other guy in Bless the Union of Souls? No, yeah, it's not Elliot. No, I, okay. don't I, don't, I don't think it is. But oh, Elliot, I met Elliot through the Reds many years ago and we would always kind of write a little bit or we'd have projects together and just kind of mess around and I just thought no better guy to really you know not only is he a super sweet guy can sing like crazy and has got yeah. a lot more melodies in his head than I do I just wanted to kind of bounce some of these demos off him and so I would take one I'd finish it with him and then we'd finish another one and just he really unlocked my brain for being able to finish an original song and feel good about putting it on a record and so you know it was it started this process that I got to get a little addicted to over time. Well, there's a lyric on some might say that grabbed me where you said, I've got the mic and you're going to have to listen to me. Did that come from you or sometimes are the lyrics co-written? So that's on some might say um, that's in the second verse. Yeah. And that 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 line was written with Elliot Sloan because the original if you, it's, it's like a different melody. The original melody was just stayed the way the beginning of it was, which, you know, um, some might say to give up. I'm going to run my mouth and never be shut up. But then he took it to a little, but I got the mic and you're going to have to listen to me. Right. That, that little swag there, that was Elliot. And, um, you know, th that's what he really helped me with was in a lot of ways, like I, I could write a song that would be a little too flat and he could just like bring a little nuance to it. Right. And be like, oh, right there. If we just change that, put a little something in it, then it just brought some life to it. And that, you know, that process really kind of got me over the hump. Hmm. 
a lot of the bio materials that I read talked about your relationship with Eddie Vedder and how he gave you notes on the songs, which is incredible. Again, that's a word that's going to come up a lot of times in my conversation with you. But was Pearl Jam the gateway band for you into rock music? Absolutely. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I'm a 15 year old kid. I'm in high school. I'm in freshman year. And, and you know, that the 10 record just was so integral to everything about my existence. And, 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 it, and it lasted through my entire baseball career. I mean, if if you came to a major league stadium and you heard Pearl Jam 10 playing and the Red Sox or the Reds were in town, there's a good chance Bronson Roy was in the in the weight room working out. Right. Like it was the fuel that kept me going, squatting heavy weight when I was 36 years old and you didn't want to do it. You know, Eddie's voice, the energy in the songs, it was the gateway for me in a lot of ways. And, and it unlocked, it unlocked, you know, um, me wanting to actually perform music, right? In a lot of ways, it, I never thought of performing music as something that could be, um, I don't know, it was just very neutral in my childhood. Like you'd hear music, but you didn't think about what it was like to perform it. And after hearing, you know, Soundgarden and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Stone Temple Pilots and Bush and all those bands started ascending, the, the, the lyrical content was a little darker, a little different. Yeah. For whatever reason, I gravitated towards it and, and it made me want to sing and play a guitar and kind of unlock that whole box. So it was never glam rock or hair metal for you as the gateway? Yeah, it was weird. I mean, I think part of it, you know, I grew up in a weight room with my dad and we were lifting weights really serious and heavy from age six. And there was always a radio on playing in the background. And there was a lot of the oldies, you know, it was the Mamas and the Papas, it was the Beatles, it was James Taylor. It was, um, you know, all those, you know, beautiful old 70s, Jim Croce. And but it kind of stopped there with my father. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going into poison and, and Motley Crue. So because I didn't get that as a, as a kid, and then you kind of, you know, they all got slayed by Nirvana in a way, right. And just brought the second thing. And I was hitting my hitting puberty. So for me, the eighties gap just almost doesn't exist. Hair bands for me just never did anything for me. Yet years ago, when I interviewed Jamie, who plays on your record and co-wrote music with you, the hair bands was that for him. I think you're talking about seeing Rough Cut in concert back then and Van right. Halen being one of his favorite bands and so forth. And then Ed, for example, Ed, your bass player, from what I remember, was more of a power pop kind of person. So everyone has different influences on your record. Yeah, absolutely. And when, you know, when I when I wrote the demos, for the most part, even if the, some of the riffs came from the guys in the band, but I'd have to come back here and melodically and story. I, I had to pretty much tell them myself, you know, but once, once I brought those real rough mixes to them, you know, I didn't, I didn't dictate how the sound of the band would be. I didn't dictate what it would sound like on the record. I didn't say, Hey, I need this to sound like X, Y, and Z or alternative or, or anything. I just wanted to tell these stories and, and, and flush through them the best way we could. And I wanted every person in the band to bring their own skill set there. I'd say the one thing that I kind of demanded was that I wanted three part harmony on it by the guys. And I wanted to be able to pull that off live. I thought it was a bit of a throwback to some, some times when people haven't done that in a long time on a record and in a world where, you know, music is sometimes played with machines and it's not really played by the humans on stage, I wanted to pull something off that was a little difficult to do. And so that was probably my one request. But as far as the sounds of the guitars or exactly what this thing would turn out to be, I didn't really, I was just letting it go where it went. And um, I, I was super pleased that the guys had their own opinions and brought a lot to the table and I didn't have to make all the decisions. Well, speaking of playing live, I know you have a couple of innings festival gigs coming up, Tempe, Arizona, Tampa, Florida, but right. is the long-term goal to do a lot of gigs? I've seen footage of you playing at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Yeah, I, you know, I've played a lot of gigs over the years. I've got, a, I've got a band here in Cincinnati that I call the Bronson Royal Band. And we, for a long time, we couldn't figure out what we were going to call this band and try to differentiate. And, and you know, the 04 came up because four guys in a band we all met that year and we won a world series and they're all new england guys and they're huge red sox fans so it all made yeah. sense but the local band here in cincy i play you know 15 20 shows a year and that's what you would have seen at mohegan sun that's the guys here we play a lot of covers we don't play any of the original stuff for the most part but you know with with the guys in the original band jamie aronson playing with miley cyrus and my drummer eric gardner playing with melissa etheridge about 100 dates a year it's going to be yeah. very difficult for me to get these guys together for a substantial amount of time um, and monetarily, you know, I don't know that it would make sense really, if we could actually go out and tour in a way that we could at least break even, you know, it, it would be tough, but I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to play these two innings festivals. 
we had a little show in Boston. We rehearsed for five days at the Paradise Rock Club a couple of weeks ago. I know we can pull this stuff off live. It sounds good. I'm happy with it. And I think the guys in the band are as well. So we're going to play these two shows and kind of see what opportunities, you know, come our way. And if nothing comes our way, you know, maybe, you know, we'll find our way in the summertime into, into popping into maybe three, four festivals or something. I think in a perfect world, if I could just get these guys to play a handful of festivals every year and get them away from their regular tours or their day jobs and, um, you know, and do this stuff. I know they're excited about it. I know they're enjoying playing the music, especially because they, they've played in bands for a long time that they might not have as much to do with the creation of the music right. as we did together. You know, we produced this as a band all together. We had no producer in the, it's, it's, it was an engineer and five guys. And so this really is a representation of everyone in this band. And I, I know that they'd probably want to get out and play it if they get the opportunity. Now that you have this new record, does that mean it'll be covers plus two, three songs from the new record? I think playing with these guys like at Innings Fest is going to be almost the whole record with a couple of covers. Oh, so, so it flipped. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, we're definitely gonna give. You know, I, writing this record and telling my own stories and being happy with the way the music sounds, I'm kind of hell bent now on t letting people hear the music. You know, and I know it's tough sometimes to to go listen to a show and you've never heard any of the songs, right? That's just how it is. But when I look at the old days and Pearl Jam goes out. In 90 and 91, they're, they're not playing any covers. They're playing their stuff top to bottom. And I know Stone Gossett was over in the corner cringing sometimes at some of the songs that Eddie wanted to play that maybe weren't big hits. But the truth is, you know, you put this stuff on a record for a reason, right? You think it's good enough to tell that story. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing these songs and not really thinking in a way of playing cover songs at all. Greg Hawks is on this record. Now, the Cars are considered a Boston band, but I don't know if Greg Hawks is in Massachusetts still. How did he wind up in the picture for this? Well, he is in Massachusetts. <laughs> that's, okay. that's probably most of the reason why he ended up on it. But Ed, Ed Velasquez, who you know, is, um, you know, he's he just got, you know, he's a historian of music for one. He just lives it, right? I mean, like I'm, I consider music a little bit of a hobby for me. It probably borders lying on a job compared to some other people, but but he really has lived this for such a long time. He doesn't ever come out of the music scene. And he knew Greg. And he just thought that one of the songs on the record Greg would really be, um, would want to play on. He picked two of them. One of them was Side Effects that wind up playing. And, and for me, it was one of the greatest parts on the record because for one, it was unexpected. I didn't know it was going to happen when we were going to the studio. And when he sent the part back, I've got this great video clip of him working the part out on that Korg. I mean, maybe the most famous Korg in the world, right, ever. And mm -hmm. he's working the part out and you can hear him playing it over. And in the background, he's playing this part that he calls, he called it the Twilight Zone part. And mm -hmm. not only does it sound cool, but I just, I, I love the Twilight Zone for one. And, and uh, you know, just to have him stamp that as um, I really thought he brought the, the chorus alive and um, I already liked the song, but to put Greg on there and have him play such a cool part meant, meant everything. Something you mentioned before was the music that you'd come out to when you were playing. I went to a baseball game for the first time a couple of months ago in Mexico. And I'm surprised to see between every pitch, not every at bat, between every pitch, they change the song or put on a song. Is that something that you've ever experienced in any baseball game whatsoever? Every pitch? Only, only in Latin American countries. Okay. <laughs> and that's why you got that in Mexico. So I played winter ball in Puerto Rico. I've seen, you know, Caribbean series, what happens when you, Dominicans play in Puerto Rico. And there's bands playing on top of the dugout with horns. They got shakers. They got drums. They're playing music in between each pitch. It's an absolute riot. It's a totally different style of playing baseball. I mean, I can remember, I remember playing in Puerto Rico one time and it was literally the umpires fighting both teams. It was like something you've never heard of. Like it, it was like all four umpires back to back to back, like trying to fend off to all these players. And, you know, it's just a different style of game. You know what I mean? And um, there's a lot of energy in the place and it makes you feel like you're kind of at like a carnival in a lot of ways, you know, and you got cowbells going off everywhere, but uh, it was fun. And uh, you definitely are not going to find that an MLB game though. The first MLB player that I remember being super out about being a hard rock fan was Mike Piazza. Is Who do you remember being a music head and super out about it? I, I, I've heard Justin Turner was very instrumental in choosing the songs that people came out to, but right. I wasn't sure if, who of your teammates were or if you were friends with a lot of people in baseball and music was the basis of that. You know, over the years, you definitely run into some guys, but they're all a bit of a throwback to a generation just around my age or a bit before me, you know, if you get into the younger generations in a locker room, you know, hip hop and pop 
have just in country have dominated the scene for now, you know, a good portion of the last 15 years. And it's very difficult. I would, I would play, you know, kind of like a, I would, what I would consider like a, you know, just a mixtape basically in spring training and guys would, they'd be like, what is this man? I'd be like, that's fuel. And you know, that's Bush, man. And that's live. And that's, that's Allison chains. And they wouldn't know any of these bands, mm -hmm. but they, they love the music, you know? So it was, it was tough with the younger generation, but when I think of guys that I remember being like, hey, man, I really love the rock and roll music. One, Scott Spezio for, from the Anaheim Angels. You had Jack McDowell from the White Sox back in the day. He was good friends with Eddie Vedder, had a band called Stick Figure. Um, you know, I think um, Randy Johnson comes to mind, you know, oh, a guy yeah. who loved to play drums and loves to take photographs at rock shows. Um, those were the main, the main guys. You know, Bernie Williams is obviously doing his jazz thing, oh, but yeah. like a, a pure rock guy. You know, that, that generation that I came up in around 2000, and I would call the quote-unquote steroid generation, a bunch of big, massive dudes that were drinking a lot of beer at night and playing ba good baseball during the day and were a little reckless, that was kind of like that rock and roll vibe. And that was kind of just before me when I got into the game. Um, and then it, it slowly started morphing towards pop. But um, but Tim Wakefield plays the guitar. Jake Peavy plays the guitar. You know, there's always one or two guys. My old teammate, Jared Burton, you know, um, I've seen, I've also seen Justin Morneau at a ton of Pearl Jam shows, like, you know, Barry Zito, there's, there's a crew, uh, like a, like a core of guys that we all kind of stuck together. And even if we didn't play with each other, there was always this mutual respect. Cause we knew we kind of like, kind of, I don't know, we're in the same circles in a lot of ways, especially musically. Wow. That's a lot to process right there. And I thank you for opening up about that. So yeah. what I've learned so far is you're a big family person baseball you're forever connected to and you got the induction coming up you've got this great new record is there a number four is there even time for another number four for example is there a secret sports bar you own is there a side <laughs> hustle or is just all that enough no I think it's enough you know between most of my time I mean I, I play a fair bit of music you know if you play if you play 20 let's just say you play 20 shows in a year it doesn't seem like a lot but if you play 20 shows in a year and you've got to rehearse a little bit because you're not always in shape or the you know you need to make sure the guys in the band are buttoned up yeah. you know you're, you're you're practicing 40 40 days a year with a band you know, i'm playing in the basement by myself acoustically i'm playing performing sometimes at restaurants by myself and doing or doing charity shows or whatever so you know music is is probably you know two months out of my life in a year i love to snow ski i love to play golf and I love hanging with my friends. I mean, when you mix all that together and, and say yes to a bunch of charity stuff or, or you're helping out the Cincinnati Reds at the stadium. Yeah, I'm a pretty busy guy. I don't think I, I don't have too much room for any extras. And if there is, my wife is usually like, hey, we're going on vacation to Cabo. You hear me? <laughs> so, and that vacation in Cabo, is that because of Sammy Hagar or is that because of golf? Well, it's definitely because of golf, because. I love Sammy Hagar, but I'm not a big drinker. So I'm, I'm not hanging out at the cantina, just like putting back the old tequila. <laughs> you never know. I didn't I didn't know until this most recent took, uh, trip that I took to Mexico that Cabo was the golf haven. Has that always been your main go to thing golf or is it a I need something to do now that I'm retired? How about golf? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I enjoyed golf a bit while I was in, in playing ball, but not not nearly to the level I do now. I mean, golf has become something that is so hard and so hard to master that it's it's a really great challenge there's also layers to that that i didn't realize as far as like playing at some better country clubs with some players you've never played with and they always want to sure. bet a little bit of money and there's that nervousness and that you know are people going to think that your swing's kind of weird because you're kind of unorthodox right there's all these different things you're trying to figure out in golf but that has become something that can fill some time when you go on vacation and your wife wants to put her feet up and have a just have a a, a daiquiri by the pool you can do that for so long but then you got to get out and do something for a few hours to kind of let some steam off. There you go. Well, my last question for you is now that you have this record done, are you already thinking about the next album? No, not really at all. Um, you know, I wrote 24 songs for this, for this record, 10 of them wind up making, I think we probably cut 13 of them in the, in the studio. And we put the 10 best that we thought on there kind of fit the mold, but I'm not, uh, I haven't really, I'm, I've am i been sitting in the basement for the last couple of weeks just trying to figure out these songs acoustically and how I can perform them for people by myself and bring enough magic to them because the guys in the band are holding it down with so many things that I can't do physically. I'm not a good enough guitar player to do some of this stuff, especially when you're the guy singing. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure them out my, my own way. So I think I'm probably going to be stuck on this record, honestly, for at least 12 more months before I ever think about going to write another song. Well, the key is... So much coming up for you. And are you allowed to say which restaurant we could see you at performing live? Or is that the secret Lalo thing? 
No, I don't. It's never, it's usually a one-off. It's never, it's never always the same. Sometimes in my hometown in, in Brooksville, Florida, small little place where you'd never see me. But if, if people want to see me live, you know, playing with the Cincinnati band, there is a Bronson Royal band Facebook page. And we usually update that. And sometimes you get 12 Pearl Jam songs in a night and that's it. And sometimes you get the Beatles, Tom Petty and Bruce Springsteen, you know, it just depends, but they're usually always cover songs and the, and the, and the shows are fun. Hope to see one of those gigs in the near future. And thank you for your time. Looking forward to whatever's next from you, Bronson. All right. I appreciate it. Outrocast.